Hey everybody, how are you today? So today we're moving into chapter seven, section two. So we're continuing to talk about imperialism, which remember is this idea that one country or one culture takes over another country or culture. And it's not a new concept. It's something that's been happening throughout thousands of years because people are interested in conquering others because they gain wealth or they gain power in terms of land and resources. Um, they prove themselves or they believe that they are able to spread their way of life, their culture, their religion, their traditions. But we said that, remember, during the late 1800s, many European countries become interested in new imperialism, this idea that they're going to see how many countries in the world they can conquer. And they're really focused specifically on African countries and Asian countries because those countries don't have the technology to fight back. And this was all spurred on, remember, because of the Second Industrial Revolution. So all these European countries had started producing products and factories, and they had new inventions, and now they were looking for new markets. They were looking for people to buy their goods. They were looking for cheap ways to get resources, and it all kind of comes together and falls in place. And the United States is going to get caught up into this sense of jingoism, remember, this sense of aggressive nationalism. And before you know it, we're going to be fighting a war against Spain. And Spain is a country that was pretty powerful at this point in world history. It was on the decline. It was probably its most powerful in the 1600s. Um, you know, you think about Columbus sailing the ocean blue uh, in 1492. Remember, he was sailing for Spain. So in the 1415 into the 1600s, Spain was a very powerful nation. Uh, it owned land all over the world through its imperialist conquests. It had acquired a lot of gold and committed terrible atrocities. And so by the time we get to the 1800s, it's actually kind of on the decline. It had already gone through what we consider its golden age in terms of an empire, and it was actually starting to lose land as uh, colonists fought back and wanted independence. And so the territory we're really going to be focusing on here, if you look at the political cartoon there, is we're going to be focusing on Cuba and how the people of Cuba desperately want their independence from Spain. And the United States is going to be going to war with Spain because supposedly we're against imperialism. Yeah, that's right. We're against imperialism. We sympathize with the Cubans and understand their desire to be free, just like we, of course, were once controlled by Great Britain or England, same thing, and we wanted to get our own freedom. So supposedly that's why we're going to be going to war with Spain to help the poor little Cuban people. But in reality, we're not gonna let Cuba go once the war is over, which shows we're kind of a liar. We're a huge hypocrite. We're going to claim that we need to protect them and we're going to really create a you know informal kind of way of controlling them uh, as we create a protectorate. And so that's definitely a type of new imperialism. And we're also going to be acquiring Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines in the process. And if you notice, you can kind of see in this political cartoon, you know, because remember that's one of our goals this chapter is we're analyzing more cartoons and really trying to figure out what are the themes, what are the views of the author, what's the cartoonist message he's trying to make. And in this one, you notice there's Uncle Sam looking pretty young, pretty tough, and he is willing to cross the water, leave the ship. Somehow, you know, he's got these superhuman powers that he can walk on water, and he's just going to cross over to Cuba. And as you can imagine, he's going to take it. And so it's definitely going to be about American war and dominance. And you can see that, you know, Uncle Sam is spurred on by this cloud of war, so to speak. So what we're going to be talking about today is I'm just going to be getting into the beginning of Chapter 7, Section 2, which is really the heart of this chapter um, because it focuses on war. And we're going to be talking today about the causes of war. And as far as your assignment goes, um, I cut down the bookwork for this chapter. I was going to do more, but we're just going to be doing, uh, we already did page 263 last week. We're going to be doing page 269, numbers 1 and 2 this week. I didn't give you a lot of actual written or graded assignments this week that will go in Skyward because I want you to be working on your final project. And so make sure you come to the Google Meets or email me with questions so that you can get going on that because that will be your big 100-point uh, project for the quarter, and that's due next week. And I've kind of laid out the rest of your assignments for the semester. So today we're going to talk about the causes of the war, and then we'll talk really about uh, the battles of the war and kind of its lasting impacts uh, on the lecture that I put out on Wednesday on the 9th. And then we'll talk later about kind of the lasting impacts on the world. And we'll be eventually looking at, you know, how these, you know, items all lead us to World War I, especially as we get into second semester. So we're going to talk first about Cuba. 
So in case you didn't realize it, um, I don't remember if it's 80 or 90 miles, to be honest, but it's 80 or 90 miles from the border of the United States. In case you never realized it's that close, it's that close. Um, sometimes you'll hear in the news stories of people who are refugees. A refugee is someone who has escaped a country um, because there was war, there was poverty, there was some kind of upheaval, um, maybe there was some kind of um, disaster in terms of weather, and so now they are looking for a new place to live. And so many people, you know, we know in desperate moments have gotten some food together, some water, um, a little bag of stuff, and they've gotten on some kind of makeshift raft or boat, and they've attempted to come to the United States um, for a better life because life in Cuba historically has been very difficult and it's only an 80 or 90 mile voyage. And of course, if you're already thinking, well, why would the U.S. care so much about it? Well, think about it. It's only 80 or 90 miles away um, from that southernmost tip of Florida and from the Florida Keys there. So we're interested in it because it would be a great place to put a military base. It would be a great place to launch an attack to make sure that people in Florida and in the mainland U.S. are not attacked. So we would love to obtain Cuba, which was owned historically by the Spanish. The Spanish made tons of money off of Cuba because Cuba has excellent weather and it had fertile land and it was great for growing sugar. And they had historically all of these sugarcane plantations and they, they had rum and they had all sorts of different products that they were able to produce there that created a huge profit for the Spanish. Um, we know that, in fact, one-third of the world's sugar in the mid-1800s, so about 1850, give or take, one-third of the world's sugar all came from Cuba. So it really was generating a huge amount of revenue for the Spanish government. And the Spanish people, um, of course, were getting wealthy off of the, the labor of the Cubans, and the Cubans were enslaved. Um, Spain did not end slavery in Cuba until the 1880s, so a good 15 to 20 years after the United States Civil War ended and slavery um, was outlawed in the U.S. So as you can imagine, people in Cuba hate this. Uh, we know that in 1868 in particular, a man by the name of Jose Marti, I really should have an accent there on the Jose and the Marti and the E and the I, Jose Marti launched this unsuccessful revolution and it was really about ending slavery, it was about kicking out the Spanish people. It was about trying to gain autonomy, which means freedom for Cuba. They didn't want to be uh, in slaves anymore. They didn't want to be ruled, um, you know, by a foreign power. And we know that uh, for a while, they, you know, they had some successes. They were able to kill some leaders uh, of the Spanish government. They were able to burn down some property. The rebellion kind of went on for several years, and it got some press, some notoriety in the public, but nothing really changed. Marti was exiled, so basically he had to leave the country or face death, and he ended up going to the United States. And while he was in the United States, he started, um, you know, launching kind of a movement in New York City and in Florida where he was gaining support and passing out pamphlets and making speeches, trying to get people in America to say, hey, Things are really bad in Cuba. This is really close to the U.S. You should care about this. There's still slavery in the world. People are being mistreated, whether they're men or women or children. We need to end this. And it's not like today. You know, you might still bury your head in the sand about what the world's problems are, but there's world problems all around us in terms of rape and trafficking of children and genocide. All of that's still happening in the world today and poverty. And it's easy to find out about it today because you can use the Internet. But back then, there's no... PBS documentaries, there's no history channel, you know, you have to read the newspaper, and if the news is not covering a story, you know, you would be very difficult to learn about it. So it was trying, something, one of Marti's goals was to get the U.S. to really care about this. And over time, <coughs> excuse me, the U.S. started to care about it more, because more and more wealthy American businessmen started to ask the Spanish government for permission to buy land there, to buy plantations, and to uh, start producing their own sugar cane. So at the same time as the Dole brothers, right, that I talked about last week, were going to Hawaii and buying up land and, you know, growing sugar cane in Hawaii and selling pineapples back to the Americans, the same thing was now happening in Cuba. And we saw more and more Americans going there, working out deals with the Spanish government and getting wealthy as well. And for the most part, yeah, the Americans also had Spanish workers who were slave labor, and then in time, when slavery was outlawed by the 1880s, then they paid the people to do the labor, but they really weren't paying them that well at all. And so, 
what we're seeing happen is that Americans, just like the Spanish, were getting wealthy off of the Cuban people for the most part. And for a while, things kind of continued on. But once we get to the 1890, there is a new tariff, a new tax on imported goods. And we talked about this last week, right, with the McKinley tariff and how once this tariff came out, it became very difficult for the Dole brothers, right, to make money off of the pineapples that they were selling because if they have to pay an import tax because they're taking a foreign product and bringing it back into the U.S. for sale and they have to pay a tax, they're going to have to charge higher prices to offset the cost of that tax so they don't lose out on money. <clears throat> and this is what's exactly starting to happen now with the American businessmen who are having to pay these taxes as well. And it's cutting into their profits. And so they're already starting to think to themselves in a very similar story, hmm, wouldn't it be great if Cuba was its own free country? Because Cuba, if it was its own free country, you know, we could simply just own land here and maybe eventually Cuba could be a free country and then maybe one day it could even be part of the U.S. Ooh, same story as Hawaii going on, basically. And if it could become part of the U.S., we wouldn't have to pay these taxes, you know, we could make even more money. So there's businessmen who are thinking this, but it's not like um, there's as much of a, a sense of unity among these businessmen or support. Um, and so kind of going down in Hawaii at the same time, and Hawaii seems to kind of be a smaller area with more support, plus you don't have to deal with, you know, a foreign power like Spain. Uh, hopes of really Cuba joining the United States seemed very low at this point, since Cuba was still owned by a major foreign power of Spain, plus the Cuban people wanted their independence. So it'd be like if you had to deal with Lily Kwani in Hawaii, plus a whole other element. But with all this drama happening in Cuba, by 1895... <clears throat> Jose Marti basically goes back to Cuba, he brings men and women with him and support, uh, and a lot of that men, women, and support came from Americans, American businessmen who, like I said, they wanted to see Cuba gain independence from Spain and then perhaps one day be free and then perhaps one day become part of the U.S., and so money, guns, supplies all went to Cuba, and it was going to be part of the revolution. Now, Marti dies in the revolution. But for a short while, a very short while, Cuba is able to declare its independence and call themselves the Republic of Cuba and claim that they're not going to listen to uh, Spain anymore. Well, that's not going to last for very long at all. Now, things aren't going to um, stay like this in Cuba for very long at all. President Grover Cleveland, he's the outgoing president, and then President McKinley will be the incoming president. Same story we saw as with Hawaii. Cleveland really did not want to get involved in the Cuba situation at all, because remember, he is anti-imperialism. He is anti-involved getting involved in foreign affairs. He didn't want to conquer other nations, especially since he believed they deserved autonomy or freedom. And if they were trying to you know, get rid of their colonial oppressors, in this case Spain, why would the U.S. get involved? So Cleveland did not want to be involved at all. That's going to be, of course, changing as McKinley comes into office. So for a very short time, Cuba is technically, you know, supposedly its own little country of this Republic of Cuba, but I say supposedly because it's kind of in name only. By 1896, the Spanish basically uh, retaliate, and they send in a huge amount of troops. And as I said, Martí is going to be killed. Um, the new country of Cuba, this Republic of Cuba, is kind of going to be taken out of power. And they're going to be sending in the man that you see in the picture named General Weiler, who quickly gets the nickname of the Butcher to put down rebellion. He starts locking it down hardcore. So there's no more printing of pamphlets, there's no more free speech, there's no more free press, there's no more protest marches. And he would go through the countryside and he would find people who seemed like they were going to join the major protests that were happening in the city and he would take them and he would lock them up, men, women, children, and he would throw them into basically concentration camps, which are, are labor camps. And he would be violent to them, he would beat them if necessary, he would try to whip them in submission. So we're talking about usually, you know, terrible human atrocities and violence and force, and he would force them to work. And some people died because the conditions were unclean, because they lacked access to medication, because of the violence, because of lack of food, just the harsh treatment, lack of mental health being taken care of. And from the overcrowding, many people died. And the newspapers, of course, are going to report all of this. And this is when we start to see that, you know, even though Marti is dead, 
remember, as I said, there's all these American businessmen in Cuba who desperately want to see Cuba gain its freedom from Spain, perhaps become its own country, and then perhaps one day become part of the U.S. And they're kind of watching the same story unfold in Hawaii. And, you know, some of these American businessmen are going to be contacting journalists back home in the U.S., saying, you need to report what's happening here. This is a humanitarian crisis. This is a human rights issue. The U.S. needs to get involved. We need to help them get rid of the Spanish. We are terrible people if we don't. And they're trying to stir up sympathy so that Americans want to get involved to supposedly end imperialism, to supposedly give these people freedom. And they try to tug at people's heartstrings and say, this is so similar to what happened to Americans when we were trying to fight for our independence from you know, Britain. But this is so much worse. And for a while, it really and truly, you know, is working because as Americans hear about how there's 200,000 Spanish troops, you know, involved and the butcher is doing these terrible things, we're starting to really care uh, that tens of thousands of people, especially children, are starving and dying from disease. And of course, as McKinley leaves office, or I should say as Cleveland leaves office and McKinley comes in a very pro-imperialism president, things are definitely going to start to change. And you're going to be watching later this week the president clip about William McKinley and about how he wins the election because he really, he's going up against uh, William Jennings Bryan, who was the Populist Party candidate. You know, remember, populism is all about the People's Party, helping farmers, helping workers, anti-immigration, shorter workday, um, getting standardized railroads. Uh, William Jennings Bryan made the big cross of gold speech. He wanted money to be backed up by gold and silver. He lost because McKinley had the support of the robber barons, big business. Um, and so McKinley, Republican candidate, remember most of the people getting elected during this era are all Republican except for Cleveland, uh, McKinley wins. And he does say that he wants America to be neutral, that he wants America to avoid war, because we've always really had an isolationist policy. Isolationism, not being involved in foreign affairs, was to our benefit. It meant that soldiers were safe, people didn't die, it didn't cause us excess money. You know, if we don't poke the bear, if we don't get involved in other foreign countries' issues, they're not going to perhaps attack us at home. But he realizes, of course, you know, after speaking to many of his robber baron friends, hey, this is in our best interest to get involved in what's happening in Cuba. Especially because some of Weiler's men, the butcher, he's, his, some of his men are starting to attack and destroy property and plantations and sugarcane, uh, which is owned by American businessmen. And so now these American businessmen are writing back to their robber baron friends and to the newspapers who are reporting it and to McKinley saying, hey, we need to protect our property. We're afraid for our lives. Uh, well, obviously the answer is just leave, but they're invested. They want money. And they're convincing, you know, McKinley, what we have to do here is to help these people get our freedom. And this is when the news really gets involved as well. So uh, I'm going to talk more about this at the Google Meet, but there's two major um, news outlets in the world at this point in time. You've got Joseph Pulitzer and you've got William Randolph Hearst. Both of these guys are major newsmen. And what you're going to see is that each of them really are going to try to influence politics. So William Randolph Hearst, he owned the New York Journal, and Joseph Pulitzer owned the New York World. And both of them are in New York City, and they're trying to make a name for themselves. They're excellent writers. You know, they come from a family tradition of writing and of authors and of money and trying to influence politics. And they're both really interested in imperialism and America going to war because war sells papers, blood sells papers. Um, you know, many people in journalism will say that the top nori, that the idea is always if it bleeds, it leads. That should be the main story because it gets people's interest. And at this point in time, you know, people got their news from the newspaper. The radio was being created, but most people didn't have it. Um, you know, and so if there's no radio, if there's no television, if there's no internet, there's no text messages, not even everybody had a phone, you know, the newspaper was how you got your information. And so, Usually boys would stand on street corners and they'd scream extra, extra, read all about it. And they'd yell at the headline. And, you know, if you've got two boys on competing sides of the street and they're each yelling out headlines, 
what makes one paper better than the other? Well, you might just buy a paper because you're walking on that side of the street. Uh, you might buy a paper because you end up liking one of their favorite, you know, authors there. Um, but also you might buy a specific paper because you find the headlines really intriguing. And so they started using something called yellow journalism. And so it's the idea that, you know, it's not fact and fiction. It's not black and white. The you know, the words have been muddied, so to speak, or exaggerated, sensationalized to try to sell papers. And so they started to really play up on the fact that Weiler was a butcher. Now, we know that he was violent. So he had committed atrocities, but they just really start to, um, you know, really sensationalize it, talking about blood, 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 and how there's blood everywhere in the streets because they're desperately trying to sell papers. And it's going to be... Um, you know, a lot of the work by these two men that gets many people in New York and throughout the United States to say they start writing their congressmen and what they start writing McKinley saying we have to go to war to help these people. Now, Hearst, in particular, during this time period, he is going to print a letter uh, and it's written by a man by the name of DeLone. And DeLome was the Spanish ambassador to the United States. And in this letter, uh, which is supposedly intercepted and then printed by William Randolph Hearst, in the letter, basically, they criticize McKinley. They say that McKinley is an idiot. Um, and basically, all these kind of insults about how he's weak and he is, um, you know, just, you know, a stupid man, so to speak. And so, yet again, as Hearst prints this letter, it continues to kind of build this rally cry by many Americans where they say, oh my gosh, you know, um, the Spanish people, they think that our president is stupid. They're saying all these terrible things about him. Of course, this letter was not supposed to be uh, intercepted, you know, and was it real? Was it authenticated? We think so. Uh, there was some, you know, thoughts that maybe it was not, that perhaps it was, quote unquote, fake news. Now, I'll talk more about, you know, fake news today, but you have to remember that all news really and truly does have a bias. You know, the the authors who are writing an article, um, you know, they have an intent, they have a purpose, they use facts, but for the most part, they perhaps have a bias. And the goal is to really and truly, you know, as you're reading a news story, if you're watching a news story, um, whether you're reading it in a newspaper, a magazine, online, or watching it on TV, on YouTube, wherever, you really have to think about, you know, where did the source come from? Is it ABC? Is it CBS? Is it NBC? Um, you know, they're focused more on the facts. They might have a little bit of a, a partisan bias, meaning they might support a little bit of a party over the other, but for the most part, it's not a biased source, uh, even though all people do tend to have somewhat of a bias. Compared to some newspapers uh, and media outlets, they're, they're paid, you know, they're created uh, for a specific purpose. So, for example, I'll take CNN. It's the cable news network. Um, you know, it is created purposely to support the left. So it's created purposely to support the liberal viewpoint. Okay. And so liberal, for the most part, talks about change. Uh, and that's the Democratic Party compared to the Fox News network specifically supports the conservatives or the Republican Party. So when you're watching a news story on either one of those networks, if you're watching it, they're purposely portraying facts in a specific light to support the views of a political party. And they're going to purposely try to make stories so that they make the other party look bad. Like literally the people who own the cable company, that is their intent and purpose. Uh, and there are newspapers who do that as well. Why? Because those people have money and they used it to obviously create a newspaper or news outlet to sell papers or to make money off of stories to try to get their point of view across and to eventually get people to vote in a certain way. So, you know, that's biased news, but that isn't necessarily uh, fake news. Fake news is when we're talking about things that are like modern day clickbait or like National Enquirer that you see as you're at um, the register, at the grocery store, at Fairway or at Walmart, you know, when it's just complete and other you know, falsehoods, which have no representation whatsoever. So when we're talking about yellow journalism, yellow journalism, for the most part, would be biased news, highly biased news, but it wasn't fake. You know, it was based off of real evidence 
but it was heavily biased, um, you know, supporting one viewpoint or the other. In terms of like fake news, like computer falsehoods, they had that back then as well. So the idea of having, you know, bias in the media, you know, where they kind of have one viewpoint or the other, which is really and truly what yellow journalism kind of is, or having fake news, you know, all of that still has existed for quite some time. So the reason we're talking about all of this is because, you know, this is what's getting Americans to want to go to war and to help a group of people is because of what they're reading in the news. So just to wrap up, fake news, not true news. You know, they're pretty much just making up the facts whatsoever. A lot of the times today when you hear people throw around the term fake news, they really shouldn't be using it. Um, because if it does have any kind of truth to it, then it's not purely fake news. Um, so is there fake news out there? Like alien mom has 500 pound alien baby? Yes. Uh, a lot of the crap that's printed in the National Enquirer could go into that category. But even if that some of that isn't true fake news, more so yellow journalism is more about media bias, um, where they exaggerate headlines and sensationalize things to try to get the facts across. Um, it was really bad, obviously, during this time period from 1895 to 1898. Uh, it still is around to this day. But, you know, you're going to try to use news sources which, you know, represent views on both sides. So here's just a picture of William Randolph Hearst, and he actually literally once said, you provide the pictures and I'll provide the war. And especially now that Kodak has created the camera and we're starting to see more of a rise in photojournalism, um, the pictures, you know, that were being uh, provided uh, to the American businessmen and then to Hearst and, you know, so the American people could see it. It's really what made the Americans uh, hysterical about the situation and really cried for war um, you know, against Spain to help the Cuban people get their independence. Now, what's really going to lead to war, though? Because all of this is just kind of build up. And so you've got a couple of factors here, which you're going to be looking at 269 when you do your assignment in the book. But of course, you know, it's the sympathy for the Cuban people and how they were treated against Weiler. It's the fact that American businessmen own land in Cuba. Um, and they're making money off of the growth of sugarcane. And then, of course, there's all this, you know, um, yellow journalism, which is basically exaggerated um, headlines. Usually the tr facts themselves are true, though. Uh, so there's clearly media bias, basically, is another way to think of yellow journalism. If it's in its extreme form, uh, it could turn into what, like, the National Enquirer today is writing or clickbait. And, you know, all of that is leading to it, but really kind of, the last straw that breaks the camel's back that leads us to the Spanish-American War, where we're going to go to war with Spain to help the Cubans get their freedom and perhaps eventually get Cuba for ourselves, is the USS Maine blows up. And now that William McKinley is in office, you know, he's more pro-imperialism, he's more pro-involvement, he claims he cares about autonomy or getting the, the Cuban people their freedom. And he's also worried about the American businessmen who are there, who are starting to write and say that they're afraid for their lives, that their property is getting destroyed. So he sends this ship, the USS Maine, um, to basically the harbor outside of Havana, Cuba, and says, in case, like, you know, bad stuff starts to hit the fan, these people can evacuate these Americans and get on the boat and come back home since they're refusing to leave their property behind. Now, while the USS Maine is... Um, you know, sitting in the harbor on the evening of February 15th, we know that all of a sudden the boat explodes very dramatically and 268 men were killed. And of course, this made many Americans say the Spanish did it. They clearly did it. They wanted to, um, you know, kill the Americans because they saw us as a threat. Uh, you know, we had a military force in their harbor. They thought that we were going to help the Cubans and attack them, and so they were behind it. And this led to immediate calls for war. But if you think about it more deeply, the Spanish were intimidated by us. We were already starting to build up our army, and um, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, who was our Secretary of State in charge of foreign policy and in charge of our naval unit, he was starting to build up our Great White Fleet and build up our Navy. We were starting to show that we really were a force to be reckoned with. Spain was on the decline. They could barely put down their own revolution. Why would they want to get us involved? Um, why would they want to get help 
you know, for the rebels. So, you know, what would really be the, the point? Because, of course, if they blew us up, naturally it would drag us into war. So there was some, you know, sides, some points of view to be considered on both sides, but you really couldn't kind of um, ignore the people, the fact that people wanted vengeance. They wanted uh, some kind of retaliation. They wanted someone to be blamed and to be punished for the death of those 268 American men. And so many war hawks in Congress who were pro-imperialism and believed in jingoism or this aggressive nationalism called for war. And of course, William Randolph Hearst and um, Joseph Pulitzer, they each had, if you can notice, the New York Journal on one side uh, and the New York World on the other, they each started calling for war, having even bloodier, crazier um, you know, headlines that were sensationalized with yellow journalism. And so eventually, McKinley feels like he has no other choice and on April 20th, 1898, he declares war on Spain. So just to wrap up all of the different causes of the war here, and so yet again, guys, these are your notes. Feel free to write down as much as you want, as I will post these eventually later on Google Classroom. But the USS Maine exploding was kind of the last straw, which leads us to war. Um, but it's really about economic reasons. You know, the fact that we were looking for um, new markets to sell our goods to, but also resources like sugarcane. It was about political power. You know, supposedly it's about helping uh, socially to save the Cubans from General Weiler. But in political power, it's all about maybe we can, you know, gain more land for ourselves to look more powerful and gain more prestige and perhaps even in terms of militarism to gain a naval base since, you know, Cuba is so close to the U.S., some people say it's about social Darwinism, that it's survival of the fittest, and if the Spanish can't control their property and if the Cubans can't fight back, so be it. Other people would say it's about the frontier, that we're always needing to expand, right, because there's no more land to expose, expand to in mainland United States. And yet others would say it's about sympathies, that we have to help these people, you know, fight for their independence just like we fought for ours against England. So last slide, uh, President McKinley. 25th president in the United States. We've already kind of talked about how he's clearly pro-imperialism. He eventually annexes Hawaii. He claimed he wanted to do anything to avoid war with Cuba, but he is really kind of buying into the yellow journalism, the exaggerated sensationalist headlines, um, which these newspapers are putting out there to sell papers. And he starts to support the idea of war as well um, and realizes that it is in America's best interest to go to war. That's it for now, guys. Have a great day.